Okay, welcome. This is Christian Knight of Chapel, and we're here for our seminar classes. Uh, we just like to make a uh, notation, a correction on our uh, time schedule for Monday classes for biblical uh, biblical eldership. On Monday morning, it will be 7:30 a.m. and not 8 a.m. 7:30 to 8:30 a.m. That's Monday class. We only have one class on Monday which is from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. This is U.S. time. And, of course, the time is going to be in Africa and passes. In other countries, it's going to be six hours uh, later. Okay? All right. Well, we thank the Lord. We're dealing with uh, our seminary classes, as we told you. The materials and books are free. But we insist that you, you enroll. And, and some of you have. You have sent me your email address. And corresponding with that, this is my email address and my phone number to my office here uh, in the church, which is in my, my home. Uh, my personal uh, Zoom number is here. So sometimes we will go Zoom and ask some questions live from our students, where you can call in, and uh, or you can at the same time, we will have Facebook that you can type in your questions with the given time that we may have. Okay? I will be your instructor for Christology, the person, the life, the person, and the work of Jesus Christ. That's one course. The next course is church history, which we're going to start in a few minutes. That's going to be dealing with uh, part one and two of church history from A.D. Uh, 32 to A.D. Uh, 1500. We may not even get that far. That's part one and two. Then our next course is biblical eldership. So we have three courses that we're going to do on one Monday, biblical eldership. On Wednesday and Thursday, it's going to be Christology, church history, and again, biblical eldership. Now, again, I cannot overemphasize that you, I, in order for us to correspond and for you to get the books and the materials, which are free, I have to have the certain necessary information, your email address or phone number or something so we can correspond, enable me to send you uh, the materials or the book. Whether it's your address, whether it's your email address, whether it's your phone number or something that we can communicate. All right? Now, all our classes, we will have uh, books, but our main book will be the Bible, of course, and we will go into it in a reform teaching manner, in that the word reform means restoring back to the scriptures, the apostles, the teachings of the word of God. Uh, our first course that we're going to start, and here it is 8 o'clock now, and right now in Africa, you guys watching me, it's probably about two minutes after uh, two. But nevertheless, this is church history, a glorious institution. Now, to get your materials for uh, church history, the two books that we're going to be using, okay? If you send me your email address, I can send you, uh, you can go, or you can go to uh, chapellibrary.org and pull up a glorious institution for church history, part one and two, all right? And if you can get part one, that's where we're going to be covering, starting. Then the next book we're going to get is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyr by John Fox. Now, we're going to be uh, going through that book also. Now, church history, uh, many people, many churches do not focus on church history, and we need to develop that in our understanding so we can know the past that we can do better right now in the future. Right? Knowing the past can help us to do better in, in the future. And this is the reason why we are doing this course in uh, church history. Now, from 
as we begin this course, we're going to look at part one, when the church was young, and we're going to look at A.D. 32, 33 to A.D. 754. We're going to look at the birth of the New Testament church. We're going to look at the suffering saints and the found, number three, the foundation of faith. Number four, we're going to look at the sign of the Messiah. That, took, that takes us to A.D. 313. And then it's going to take us to number five, the councils of the church. Right? And we're going to move on from, from there. So if you want to follow us, it's important now, in order to follow us, to go to chapellibrary.org, uh, chapel download it on your phone, okay? Google it, and that'll come up, and then go to a glorious institution, part one, part two, all right, in church history. All right? The same thing, you can Google, or you can go on your phone, or your laptop, if you have internet, any kind of uh, social media services, and, um, and pull up this information. Also, Fox's Books of Martyrs. We're going to be looking at that, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And that's very easy to get on. All you have to do is go on the website and type in uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, before, the, it, before it was named Fox's Book of Martyrs, it was called the Acts and Monuments. Acts and Monuments. Same book. The title changed to Fox's Book of Martyrs. All right? Okay, let's let's begin our lesson with you know, church history. Now, the book of Acts is going to cover the early part of church history, a direct look at the early church, which was started in the days of Pentecost, on that, day, on that particular day in the upper room. And in Acts chapter 1 and 2, it kicks off the early church uh, dwelling, dwellings. Okay, so you want to uh, have your Bible open to the book of Acts because sometimes we're going to refer to uh, the book of Acts in our, in our lesson assignment because it's the birth of the New Testament church. It's the Old Testament church. It's the New Testament church. Okay? We're going to look at the background and the nature of the church, both visible and invisible. We're going to look at the physical preparation for the church, the spiritual preparation for the church, the rapid expansion of the church, and the book of Acts gives us that. And then we're going to look at uh, selected early church elders, uh, leaders, and the writings of the fathers. All this is, is that's why it's so important for you to download the uh, chapellibrary.org and go there so you can see the same manuscript that I'm reading and we're going over with your book of Acts in your Bible, book of Acts. So we're gonna be looking back and forth at both of them, okay? Now, when we say uh, the church, the background of the church, the story of human history uh, can be called his story. History, his story, God's story. Uh, it is the story of God's work in the affairs of man. The whole Bible is. It's the redemptive story of God from Genesis to Revelation. God who saw them knew that when he created man and woman, he knew that uh, he, he planned it. This is his plan, his sovereign will for man to fall and for him to show his love and redemptive power from Genesis to Revelation. Now, if you can't understand that, that's okay because that's something you can ask the Lord Jesus Christ when you see him. Why did he do this? Right? As Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us, the secret things belong unto God. We don't question it. It's not that we are being led by blind faith. It's just that it is the sovereign will of God. And as Christians, we don't all the time right, 
understand the sovereign will of God. God does as he does because he's sovereign and he doesn't have to answer to anyone. He is the almighty God. He is sovereign. But when the church was young, the word church comes from the word ecclesia. And the word ecclesia means a gathering, a congregate, an assembly. Now, of course, it means a people. People congregate, people assembly, people coming together in a congregation. Now, whether that, the place, it varies. The place does varies, okay? And um, the scripture does not tell us that it has to be in a, in a building. Okay? Don't feel as though that the visible church has to be in a building because the locale can be anywhere where groups of Christians meet together and go over the scriptures, study and worship the Bible, uh, worship God, and to have prayer. All right? Let's read. The story of human history might be called uh, his story, as I said, the story of God's work in the affairs of men. There is a grand central theme to be found in the history, and that is God's redeeming love from Genesis to Revelation. Viewing history from this perspective, where God is actively working out his plan of redemption in the affairs of men, could be called a divine interpretation of history. See, Christianity sees God as beginning gathering people for his name's sake, for to show and demonstrate his redeeming love beginning in Genesis and working his way to the end of the Bible. It's not consistent with what mythology, as far as Roman mythology, Greek mythology, Persian, and any other religion, whether it's in any country or empire or nation, wherein their gods created man or created life and everything and move on and just left it on his own. And the only way that the gods got strengthened or got encouraged or was blessed is when only when his creation or her creation, religion, prayed to them. But this is not the point of God. Right? That's why it is his story, the story of God redeeming uh, love. The Bible teaches us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting son, uh, everlasting life. The son was given about 2,000 years ago. Born in humility, raised in obscurity, Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time, Galatians 5, excuse me, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, to accomplish the great task of redeeming, redeeming his people uh, from their sins, Matthew 1.21. The Lord of glory came to earth through the literature of the house of David in the nation of Israel. The Hebrew people were privileged to be the first to be the recipient of divine truth. Their prophets had predicted the Messiah was to come, and he did came. Matthew was careful to record many incidents in the life of the Lord, and then wrote that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophets. Of course, Matthew is throughout the book of Matthew. Matthew is 2, verse 15, Matthew 4, 14, Matthew 8, 17, Matthew 12, 17, Matthew 21, and 4. And of course, our marvelous book here, written by Luke, the, God, the book of, of, of Acts. During the days of the Lord's earthly ministry, most people in Palestine did not believe that the ancient prophets were being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And because of this, the religious leaders arrested Jesus. He was tried, sentenced, and executed on a wooden cross at Calvary, Matthew 27. But on the third day, he rose from the dead, Matthew 28, verses 1 to 6. His resurrection became, his resurrection, right, became the foundation of the New Testament, New Testament church would be built upon. Right? 
Now, let's look at the nature, the nature of the church, which is visible and invisible. Right? Let's look at the nature of the church. Now, you notice that this particular lesson may be corresponding with our, our sunrise service on Sunday morning, and we are dealing with the church. It was the Lord's desire to establish a spiritual kingdom, John 18, 36. Remember, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus is not, an, he, he's not here to build a kingdom, to build an empire in his physical perspective on this earth because he says so in John 8, 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my angels, my servants, will fight for me. He's Lord. So he didn't come, Jesus did not come to establish a kingdom on earth as previous ancestors of Jesus Christ. There's a difference. And if you trace Matthews, if you trace Matthews, lineages from Jesus back from to Mary and Joseph back, you will find that it goes way back to Adam. Adam's son set and it moves on down the line and comes down to uh, Jesus Christ. So it was the Lord's desire to establish a spiritual kingdom, John 18, 36, that would touch all nations, all people of the earth, Matthews 28, 19, and 20. It was the Lord's design to call upon himself a peculiar people. Now, I know we're, 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 I, I've been quoting a lot of scriptures because I, I guess my assumptions is telling me that you guys, if the audience, you know these scriptures. So let me slow down and go back over these scriptures to prove that thought. Okay, now let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Matthews chapter 16. In Matthews chapter 16, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So that is the spiritual kingdom. Right? That is the spiritual kingdom, the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail. What that part of the scripture in Matthew 16, starting verse 17, 18, and following, is that when it says the gates of hell, when Jesus says the gates of hell shall not prevail, he's dealing with no in, in, enmity, no power on heaven and earth in any dimension will ever destroy the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ, because he says, upon me, I will build my church. All right. And that's coming from Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 and 19. All right? Okay. So, the Lord also designed the call to him. See, as he called the church, now the church, let us... Let's make a difference now, right? The church, right? The church, there's a visible church, and then there's a invisible church, right? Visible and invisible. Visible, you can see, the structure on this earth. The invisible church, let's, let's note the difference between them. The invisible church is made up of only, and I have to stress that, only the elect, redeemed people. Okay? There's a Old Testament, which, let's put it in brackets, that's the Old Testament church. That's, that's them too. And then what we're dealing with is the New Testament church. 
okay, which also are the saints of God and elect. There has always been saints. Saints. The word saint means separated. If you are sanctified. You're set apart for God. It's part of that word sanctified. You're set apart. Saint. Holy. Righteous. That's the invisible church. Everyone that is in a visible church is not a saint. Now, the visible church is made of people of a certain local church. Okay. And I put a slash there. Denomination. It may be a denomination. Structure. I'm going to get out of the way so you can see this. All right. All right. So you see here, the, the church itself, if you look at, is the visible church. It's made up of people, different people, both saved and unsaved. So there are people maybe in your church who are not saved, but they're part of that visible church, that structure, that denomination, that local church. And they may not be safe. Right? For some reason, they join the church. Right? And they're part of that gathering. They're part of that assembly. And that's what the word church is. Right? Made up of people of a certain local church, denomination, or structure. Wherein the visible church is made of only the elect, the redeemed people. Okay? Which, when we say elect and redeemed people, it began in the Old Testament church, as Stephen tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 7, the church in the wilderness, the assembly in the wilderness, the children of Israel, they gather together. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they gather together. The nation of Israel, they gather together with the prophets. Okay? So, the elect, the redeemed people. God has been redeeming people since Adam. When Adam fell, when Adam committed the sin of disobedience to God, the whole human race plunged into sinfulness. And therefore, sin passed upon all men. But here comes God redeeming love, stretching out, saying that the seed of the woman is going to come. And which he did, which is the Messiah. So, the Old Testament saints are part of the church as well as the New Testament church. Part of the saints of God. Right? Now we see here, as we keep on reading, if you turn your Bible once again, dealing with the church, to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of yourselves. All right, that's not the scripture that I want. Uh, one of the one that says you're a royal priesthood. Is that Second Peter or First Peter? All right. Okay. I must have. Looked. Okay. Let's 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 go on down. Okay. Here it is. Okay. All right. Let's move on down to the verses. Uh, uh, verses 14 and following. We'll read from there. It says, "As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance." But as he has called you, is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, ye are holy, for I am holy. Right? Now, again, we look in the scriptures, again in chapter 2, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we look at uh, the scriptures, let's see, um, here it is, verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, 
disallowed in deed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Okay, now we have stone. We have the word stone. Now remember, this is this first Peter chapter two is in reference to Matthew's chapter 16. Upon this rock, a stone, Petro, Petra. Okay, you have the two words here in Matthew's 16, which is, let me get it right, Petra, and then you have the word Petros. Now, the two words in the Greek, Petra, both of them, both of them is rock, which is simultaneously also means stone. Okay? So that's where Peter picks it up. He doesn't use the word rock. He used the word stone. That connects it with, with the saying of Jesus. So this is the reason why Peter says here in verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living stones are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice, acceptable to, to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Zion, Zion, Okay, notice that it's S-I-O-N compared to Old Testament, Z-I-O-N. You will find that again in the book of Hebrews. The Hebrew writer uses the word heavenly, heavenly house, the heavenly home, Zion, S-I-O-N instead of Z. -I That's no mistake in the lettering there. No, it was purposely to let you know as there was a Old Testament structure of the church in the Old Testament called Zion, Jerusalem, there is in the New Testament, Zion, the New Testament church, the New Jerusalem, the church. Now, you'd be amazed if you carefully, very carefully, when John picked up his pen, and say, I behold, I saw the new Jerusalem come down. And he begins to, des to describe it. If you read it very carefully and forget about your denominational teaching and look what John is saying, he is describing the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the invisible church, is the elect of God who has been redeemed. It's not a structure building that Jesus has built. See, we, we, we need to study the scriptures, and that's the whole point of these seminar classes, that you can have a true understanding. Not that others is not doing it, I'm just saying that you may have a clearer understanding of the scriptures. See, now, let me make a note here, a little bracket here, because I have to reach out somewhere to bring this back in. Remember when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again? We have been under the understanding that Jesus went to heaven and building this new Jerusalem. But this is not the case. He was using that in, Mark, in John chapter 14 as a metaphor because of the way the Jewish structure of a marriage you see, when a Jewish person, uh, when, when, when a guy wanted to marry, and this was very young people, young, young children, matter of fact, the father and the mother took the initiative of who their son or their daughter was going to marry. You had to bring a offering, you had to bring something in order to pay for them and, and, and everything like that, okay? And this was done at an early age whether it's grain, flour, wheat, dove, cattle, land, whatever it was, you have to bring. Now, beautiful illustration of this is in the book of Ruth, Boaz, right? It's beautiful, how the scriptures. So in any case, 
you got married. It was a three stage, three to four stage of a Jewish marriage. You got legally bound married at the beginning, true, as a young, young, young couple. And to 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 to, to satisfy that. The father of the daughter insists that you, as the future groom, was to give him, the family, some wheat, corn, rice, land, jewelry, money, whatever. You had to, you know, dowry. You had to pay a dowry. Even though that girl was too young to get old right now, but you had to put in your dowry early or someone else was going to get it. Now, Jesus used the same illustration, if I go to prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare, okay? Now, using that as an illustration, the two of you did not come together. You were betrothed. In that period of time, you were not allowed to have an intimate relationship with each other until the actual ceremony. Right now, we are going through that same stage as the invisible church. We are absent from our Lord. We are to keep ourselves holy. Scripture here says it now. Holy. Our conversation should be holy. We should be righteous, walking upright, living holy. Okay, In this godless world, in this world system, Keeping ourselves from spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. So that when Jesus comes back, when the groom comes to get his betrothed wife, the second stage, they was he was to take her to the ceremony. Okay? The ceremony was set up and they were legally bound. You know, you see how that they were bound together. Of course, in some countries, as ours, it's the ring thing, okay? And that he would take his bride right, to the house because in his absence, while he was living on his father's house, his own father's house, he would come and build, he would build a house next to his father's house. When the structure was complete, that's when he would come and get his bride, perform the final ceremony, pick up his bride and take his bride to his father's house, which is his house next to his father's house. And that's where they will live. When their children grow up, he will build a house next to his house. Everybody's house will build to each other house. That was the Jewish part. That's where Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. See the, see the, see the story there? That's the connection. Okay? So when Jesus says that, Peter says, it is the rock. Jesus says the rock. Peter says it's the stone, it's Petra, rock, Petra, large stone, mighty stone, here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. The same stone that's been rejected, Jesus Christ, the same stone that was cast aside, nailed to the cross, the same stone is building Petra's little stone. This is where Peter comes in when he says in verse 5, 1 Peter 2 and 5, ye also as lively stones, living stones, are built up a spiritual house, see that? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you see how Peter is using Old Testament words, priesthood, sacrifice, offerings, wherein the Christian or the saints today, Old New Testament saints, instead of giving dead sacrifice as they did in the Old Testament, instead of them worshiping that way under an old covenant, 
instead of observing all the 600 and some laws, the New Testament saints right, do not have to do that because Jesus fulfilled all that, and therefore we worship Jesus only. We give praises and glory to Jesus. We live holy and righteous, just like the Old Testament saints did, holy and righteous to the mighty stone, the mighty rock, which is Jesus Christ. Let me read these scriptures again. Follow me, please. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 4, 5, and 5. To whom coming as unto a living stone, or a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, this is Christ, but chosen of God and precious, ye also, as living stones, lively stones, are built of a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. See, a priesthood job is to offer incense, is to offer praise, is to offer worship, is to offer sacrifice. Okay? Not under the Old Testament economy, Old Covenant ways, but the New Testament, the New Covenant ways, we as Christians. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Well, also, it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion, Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confused, shall not rebel, shall not reject. They will obey. Okay? All right. So, that's the nature of the visible and the invisible church. We are called the called out assembly, the called out one. If you have repented of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, you're part of the invisible church. Yes, you're part of both as a member of the invisible church, being a redeemed elect of God, you're part of a visible church because you fellowship with others in your locale, in your structure, wherever you meet. That's the visible church. But the only thing about one thing, the other, the, the thing that that's differ in the invisible church is that you may have terrorism and wheat. Unfortunately, you may have both saved and unsaved in this particular church, which is visible. Because we don't know who's really saved. Nevertheless, the foundation stands assured. The Lord knows those that are here. So within your visible church, in your gathering, the Lord knows who's really saved. The Lord knows who's really saved. Now, as we read on, the scriptures, what the reading says, it was the Lord's design to call unto himself a peculiar people. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9, 1 Peter 2 and 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye shall show forth the praise of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past ye were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So that's why he says, and pre keep on reading, as we're strangers and pilgrims here. This is not our home. This is not our home. Heaven is our destination. We pray, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. Right? This is not our home. We're travelers. We're strangers. We're trespassers. This is Satan's domain. He's the prince in the power of the air. He's walking to and fro. We are here for one purpose. All right? When a lost sinner received Christ as Savior through repentance and faith in Christ Jesus' atoning death, burial and resurrection, his atoning death, we are here to spread the gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. 
what I should say, we're here to spread the gospel and to encourage each other, to strengthen each other in the word of God, to gather together in worship. So on that particular day, you do come and meet with other saints, not stay at home by yourself, read the Bible, listen to gospel music. That is not the plan of Jesus Christ. He has given us pastors and teachers, elders today, that we need to meet under these certain men to be taught the word of God and grow in the word of God. And as we are taught the word of God and grow, we go out and witness of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that others may repent and come into the body of Christ, the invisible church. Okay? So we are the called out ones. We are a peculiar people. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy people. And we're a nation there in verse 9. You see where it says a holy nation? It's holy people. It's the same word in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, when it says, Go ye therefore unto all nations, okay? Make disciples of all people. The word nations is people. No nation on this planet is a Christian nation. England is not a Christian nation. The United States is not a Christian nation. Ghana, Nigeria, where Australia, the, no, no, God did, is not, he didn't make a nation of Christian. It's a people who are Christians. It is a people who are chosen. It is the people, not the land, not the possession, not the, the territory. It's the person, the people. The spiritual kingdom, it consists of the redeemed people of God. Okay? This called out assembly is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. The scripture tells us the Holy Spirit of God within every true believer strengthens us. It encourages us. So when we're down, when we're in trouble, when we're going through trials and tribulations, and there will be some of you, even including myself, may get terrible sick terrible sick. We even may get a disease, a fatal disease. We may have, quote, quote, what people will call bad luck. As the question is asked, why do bad things happen to God's people? It, it, it happens. But we need to be encouraged because when these different things come into our lives, trials and tribulations in different ways, see, wherein you may have a sickness, a pain in your knee, in your back, in your body somehow. Another Christian may be experiencing unemployment. Another Christian may be experiencing poverty. Another Christian may be experiencing mental problems. Another Christian may be experiencing all kinds of different situations. But we need to realize that whatever is going on in our Christian life, the Lord Jesus Christ so planned it, allowed it. Even our persecution, our sickness, our trials, our suffering, whatever the pain, whether it's mentally, whether it's spiritually, whether it's physically, whatever comes into our lives, when Christ brought us into his church, he planned our life, the struggles, the plans, the ups and downs, whether you're depressed, whether you're going through anything, as a redeemed person, he planned that to demonstrate his power and his love because he's going to take you through it. Romans 8.28, all things work together for the good to them that love God, to the child of God. So there are some who has a multi-complex uh, of various problems in their lives then there's some with one in their lives or two but Christ allows it for his purpose for his will so there may be some of you that are facing great tremendous suffering trials of afflictions poverty sickness 
disease, unemployment, homelessness, mental fatigue, body fatigue, pressures, all kinds of mental heart and lung and whatever disease that you're going through, and you may be taking medicine or maybe you're going through something, Jesus, your Savior, our Savior, allow that to come into your life, not to punish you, not to discipline you, but to strengthen you, encourage you, to let you know of his love, that he's going to be with you, he will never leave you, he'll never forsake you. Some of you may be going through that for a length of time. Some of you may experience that overnight. Now that brings me to the book of Psalms. Remember, if you, you look it up now. Here it is. Remember when the psalmist says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. What David is expressing, he don't want you to feel that because you're experiencing something today, Monday, today, it will not affect you tomorrow. That's not what David is saying. Because look at him. For years, he was haunted by that, by Saul. So that scripture cannot mean weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So you got to understand what the word weeping may endure for the night what does that word night mean? But joy comes in the morning. What does that word morning mean? So it does not mean our, our terminology of night. So when we wake up Tuesday, all our problems are gone. That does not mean that. Your problems, your sickness, your pain, your struggling, and whatever you're going through, may exist and may continue on for another month, another year, another two years, another five years, as long as the Lord. But you see, the thing about this, bear with me with this, the thing about this is that whatever you're going through, the Lord is there with you. There is no temptation taking you, such as is common to man. But with every trial, but with every temptation, every sickness, every depressive mood, every mental problem that you're going through, whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's pain, depression, whether it's whatever that you're going through, and you have to take your med medicine. God is still with you. He is not forsaking you. Right? And that's the power of the Holy Spirit with you. Is that to some of us is instant healing, some of us is instant wealth, instant whatever, but that's not the case for everybody. Right? It doesn't mean that God loves you less because another Christian has more, or another Christian is blessed with a car, blessed with a moped, or a bicycle, or blessed with a job. Or blessed with a new house. I've seen Christians, in, especially my brethren in Africa, who have less equipment in their ministry or in their edifice where they worship at, that you, if you compare to the Christian worship place here in America, I'm just giving you an example now, that you look at it and say, wow. All things work together for good. We praise God for whatever we have. But this call out assembly is the most glorious institution that we're talking about, the church, Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. Now let's read that before we get into uh, some more reading and then we'll close out. In Ephesians chapter 5, and this is going to bear record with what I just said about our trials and tribulations and what we're going through. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, 26, and 27, it says this, Husbands, love your wives, 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See that word church? That's the invisible church. That's the body of Christ. That's the bride of Christ. That's the heavenly Jerusalem. That's Zion. That's I-O-N. He loved the church. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church. It's not saying this church. It's saying this church. The invisible church. The body of Christ. Those whom he has saved. Those whom he has elected. Those whom he has redeemed. Love the church. And he proved it by giving himself. He gave himself for it. The Son of Man did not come to be ministered, but to minister and to give his life. Okay? So that's what this passage of Scripture is dealing with. That he might sanctify it. That he might cleanse it with the washing of the water which is the word of God that he might pre that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle in any such thing but that we should be holy and without blemish see right now we're with we're with blemish we have spot we got wrinkles and they need to be ironed out we have differences. Some of you maybe uh, have differences on what I'm saying about this versus this. But that doesn't mean that you're not a child of God. If you are redeemed and elect of Christ, we will have differences. We have wrinkles in the church. We have spots in the church. But because we are holy in the sight of God, we are justified. Every Christian whether you're in America, Africa, Asia, Indonesia, Palestine, wherever you are at. If you're in Istanbul, if you're in India, China, Hong Kong, if you're in Japan, if you're in Australia, Philippines, whether you're in Canada, Europe, the Arctic, wherever you are as your nationality, as a people, and you are a child of God, you are precious in Christ's sight. You are his. And he will never let anything destroy you. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the people of God. Now, that will bring us to the part as far as Foster's books of martyr that we're going to look at uh, next week. Tomorrow, as a matter of fact, I'm sorry, tomorrow, in that part as we move on in our lesson. So, therefore, it is very important that you download chapellibrary.org and go to a glorious institution that you can follow. It. Google or maintain yourself, or you can buy the book on Amazon, Foster's Book of Mars, and have it uh, shipped to your house, your place of residence, and follow us because the same material. Okay. You can buy the book also from chapellibrary.org also. But we, we're trying to make it simplified and free by saying, hey, this is where you can go and get it free. Okay? Some people, some Christians want the book for them and they want to pay for it. There's nothing wrong with that. To each is own. Right? Now, when we come back, we're going to look at the physical preparation for the church and the spiritual preparation for the church, which will bring us to the suffering saints after the Lord left the gathering of the saints in Acts chapter 2 and following is going to begin to be um, uh, persecuted. And we want to look at a combination of the glorious institution in this persecution suffering stage, as well as Fox's Book of Martyrs as we come back, uh, Lord's will, tomorrow and take a look at that. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for our lesson today. 
And as we move on, we praise you, Father, for this teaching assignment. We give your name the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So don't forget, get your, your reading material, get it ready for tomorrow. If there's any doubt, any questions, you have the phone number, you have the email address, email me. I'll email you back the material if you're struggling to get that uh, material, okay? All right. We're going to break for about five minutes and go into our lesson, our next course, which is the examination and defense of the, the biblical eldership. I'm sorry, biblical eldership. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back, and we're going to begin our, our second course, which is the biblical eldership. Now, there's going to be uh, three particular books that we're going to be looking at. Again, if you are uh, on, um, let me write it down here. These are the books that we're going to be uh, looking at. And um, now, one of them you can get online, but you won't get the full, all the information. All right? These are the various books that we're going to be uh, looking at this much on. In Biblical Eldership class, your course in Biblical Eldership, you're going to need uh, the book uh, it's called Biblical. Eldership. Okay, this one right here. All right, and it's by Alex Xander Starch. I don't think I'm pronouncing this man's name right, and I apologize for that. <laughs> I, I, I turn up people's names, right? <laughs> Our second book would be uh, Jesus. Jesus Christ, okay, Prince of Preachers. And you know, if you heard that before, you, you heard that um, Charles Spurgeon is called the Prince of Preachers, right? but in actuality, Jesus is the Prince of Preachers, okay? And this is by... Uh, Mike, Mike uh, Abingdon. Okay, you can get that at your, uh, off of Amazon, okay, or you can get it from any Christian bookstore. Right? Then also, Alexander Strach also has a book called Acts Chapter 20. Acts Chapter 20. And um, let me see. This is short. I, I, I just I love this book. By this this is this is amazing. Okay. Uh, the next one is Acts twenty, right? And this is also by Alexander. 
hope you can see this. Okay. All right. So I'm going to let that dwell on your mind for a while. Let me show you each book. All right. This is the biblical eldership book that we're going to start with. Okay. And intertwined with that, we're going to have Jesus Christ, Prince of Preachers, learning from the teaching ministry of Jesus. See, if we stick with the teaching ministry of Jesus, because he taught the apostles, well, if, if only elders and bishops today will go back to the teaching of Jesus and stick with that, and stick with the teachings of the apostles. Because, see, it says in Matthew, go ye and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I taught you. Jesus says, I taught, I, I taught you, they teach us. The, the baton passes on. And it's strictly the scriptures. And that's what the word reform. We got to get back to Jesus being the prince of preachers. Stop putting man on a pedestal. And what, and what I mean by that, stop elevating him to the point of being a god or being someone that is invincible or someone that doesn't make mistakes. The scripture says in St. John 1, there was a man sent by God whose name was John. John had his mistakes. John was human. But he kept his eyes on Jesus, but not all the time. Because some, in prison, he lost faith. Even at the baptism of, of, of his cousin Jesus, when he came, he says, are you the one? And he didn't even want to baptize Jesus. But you see, the thing is that we're here to strengthen the elders and you that has feel the call to the ministry. And you may not have that greatness of money or the wealth or position to go to another country to, to go to a seminar or, or a college or a university and you don't have that money and you don't have that time. This is the whole point of this course to help you with that. Right? And this is the final one. It's called um, Acts 20. It says fiery wolves, they are coming. And in this book it shows, see in this picture here, once you get your book, you'll see it. It's here that sheep is in the background where the wolves up front here are about to attack. Wolves are going to come into your congregation posing as sheep, posing as ministers for such a false apostle to seek the words. And, you, and if you don't get the necessary teaching as elders, in your, under your belt, you won't be able to recognize it. These books that we're going to study at length is going to help us to grow as elders, as pastors, as ministers, and bishops within God's church. And I pray God that as he does, if, if he has called you as a man into this office. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the calling, we're going to look at the, um, the ordination, the selection, the training, the characteristics, character okay, of the elders in the church. And we're going to be looking at our introduction is going to be coming from uh, Alexander Strach, chapter 1. An explanation and defense of biblical eldership. So let's begin. Okay? Let's begin. It says here, I am aware that many people find the issue of church government or polity to be irrelevant, boring, unimportant as the color of the pews. For many Christians, church government is a non-issue. See, many Many churches have established, and that's why it's weak in its power today, because there's no structure in the church. 
if if God has called you to be an elder in the church, as a man, an elder in the church, a bishop, elder, pastor in the church, uh, he will find a way. He will let me let me let me change that. He will make a way for you to be trained, for you to be nourished, and for your preparation to get into that pulpit to congregate those people whom he had given you. Now, what we want you to see is that you need not to be like another ministry, another man. Now, let me give you a, a good illustration, a biblical good illustration. When Moses died, the scripture says in the book, book of Joshua, God speaking to Joshua. I don't want to misquote it, so you see me, I'm turning, I'm turning. <laughs> okay, it, it, it says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Yahshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, this is what God said. Now notice the words here. Please. God is speaking to Joshua. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, Jordan, you and all the people, unto the land which I will give them, even to the children of Israel. Every soul of your feet shall tread upon, I will give it unto you, as I said unto Moses. See, there's a separate ministry. My servant is dead, but I want you to act like him. Remember what he did? Do what he did. No, he says, Moses, my servant, is now dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan. Okay. Drop down. Joshua chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law for which Moses my servant command you. See, Moses taught Joshua. See, we're I, I, many ministers, many guys who are called into the ministry. They're so in a hurry to get into that pulpit on a Sunday to preach, and then when they get up there, they they, they mess up because they're ill-trained, ill-advised. Their enthusiasm overwhelms them, and they say, "I'm going out there. I'm going anyway." My pastor will let me preach next Sunday. I'm gonna get in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start doing what I want to do. You need to slow it down. As Moses taught Joshua, and this was 40 years, maybe 60. I, I gotta go back and count. And it took Joshua 40 to 60 years to learn under Moses. Now you notice now that Moses was trained in all the aspect as a royal Egyptian in the household of Pharaoh. He was adopted. Remember his, his, his stepmother found him in the basket in the water, right? She trained him. He knew science, astrology, mathematics. He, he, he knew it all. He was a smart guy. Moses was so smart. But you see, that smartness that he got in school, in his university, in his college, in Egypt, wasn't what God wanted for him to use for the, to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and guide them, protect them, and feed them in the wilderness 
See, it was it, it, it had to take a special training. So you know what God did? Jehovah, he took Moses and put him in the wilderness. While he was there, he married and had two boys. First of all, he existed in the desert for a couple of times length of time until he struggled to Midian and once he got to Midian he met up with Jethro who became his father-in-law and he married one of his daughters. He had a couple of daughters there and he got married and God was retraining Moses. Some of you need to be trained. You may have gotten your degree in theology you may have gotten your MS, a Master of Science, a Master of Theology, a Doctorate in Theology. You may have a Doctorate in Psychology, Psychiatry. You may be a law person. You may be equipped in science. A lot of prominent courses and studies, and there's nothing wrong with that. Even Martin Luther, his father, raised up a lot of money to send Martin Luther to be a lawyer. But that's not what God wanted. So Moses had to be, uh, Joshua had to be trained by Moses. It's good that you can be in a seminar, in a training, and of course, whether that training is in your church by your elders, well, one elder, or it's online, or whether it's in a school in North Carolina, USA, in Kenya, in Australia, in the, you know, wherever you live in. And if you have the money and you have the time, well, I shouldn't say time because if God calls you, you better take the time. And some of you may not have the money. Some of you may not have the means to get to one place to the other, to that academy, to that uh, training site, to that school, that seminar, that university. Some of you say, well, I'll, it's a special course in such and such university in America or in Kenya or Ghana, and I'm down in Samoa or I'm, in, I'm down in Ghana or I'm over here in Nigeria, I'm over here in Australia. I'm and I, and I want to get that training. Boy, I want that course. Oh, I want that, but they're offering, boy, I can't afford that. Or oh, the distance is so far. So you say, well, I need the training. Lord, give me the training. Give me the means. Well, here we are. Here we are. And there are others that are doing the same thing. So you prayed about it, and you chose this this particular course above others. Some of you chose another course, another way of action, and that's okay, and that's good. Some of you are being trained by your elders in church. Some of you are being trained in another church. Some of you are being trained in a conference. Some of you are being trained in other places, and that is tremendously. But I insist, as any true blue elder, will say you need a training as an elder if you're going to effectively, by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, preach the Word of God effectively. Right? Now, I, I move to this point that Joshua uh, was called by God after Moses had died. Let me get back to my reading. Like I said, church government is a is an issue that we need to consider. What we are doing here is important. It's it's in many denominations. Many hold out that the Lord spoke to you, and He called you, and you went to your pastor, you went to your elder, and said, "God called me to preach." And the average church says, well, 
we are going to do that, that and we're going to do this, and uh, this time next year or in six months, you're going to have your trial sermon, and that's going to set the stage for you to, uh, to kick off and preach it. There's no, there's no training, no training in the doctrines of Christ, no training in what we're doing here. There's no, the reason is because they don't know. So the man of God who is called by God, uh, when, when you, just like Moses, Joshua took over from Moses, uh, you should not take over or begin your ministry as pivoting on your mentor or your uh, the person that uh, you grew up in that church. Don't mimic them. You follow Christ. How do we follow Christ as a new minister? New ministry. Now you can't be a new convert and be a, you know, you can't be a new convert. That's one of the qualifications in First Peter, First Timothy. Excuse me. You can't be a new convert. Now, it's true that God can call you as a new Christian, which is a new convert. I'm not contradicting this, but again, you need training under your belt. A call. To preach is a call to study. It's a call to train. So you don't feel, don't think it, don't take it that, oh, God called me to preach and I'm just going to go out there and the Lord is going to give me what to say and I'm going to say it. You know. The Bible doesn't support that. Scripture does not support that. You are to be trained in the perspective of the scriptures by other godly men for a season of time. And it deals with your capacity in learning, because some of you can learn quicker than others. But it takes time. So don't get upset with me or anyone else when we say you're not ready yet. You need more time. Don't get upset because uh, it, it does take time to learn the scriptures because you really don't want to get up there and make a mess because you can mess up the scriptures, deceive people, and cause people to leave the church. And you can cause havoc by being ill-advised, untrained, not knowing the scriptures. So even in a society, they have structures in their government. They do. They have structure in their government. So in the Christian church, there must be structure in the Christian church in the realm of eldership, because if you don't, then everybody's going to do what they want to do. And that's why you have within church leadership rebellion. And what I mean by that, I don't care what you say, I'm going to preach. God called me to preach, and I'm going to preach. That's whether you're a man or woman. Ignoring the scriptures, but going by your feeling and emotions and others, what others says. You, you need to be developed in the scriptures because this is a new thing. See, the thing is that when, as you see in each occasion, whether you're an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the 12, okay, they were trained by Jesus for three and a half years. They, with their Moses, trained in the wilderness, 40 years. Joshua, 60 years. Each person 
have their training point that they have to endure. It's not a point that God like said, Moses, go and let my people go. 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 Do it. Moses, how, how am I going to do that? You know, even Jeremiah says, I'm young. I, I can't. So you have to be trained. You have to know. You have to know. And because it is a spiritual thing, you have to know from the scriptures what to do. God has provided explicit example instructions in his word about church elders. It's the word we relate. Now, let's look at this. As we were saying last week, Sunday, uh, concerning, uh, well, what well, yet yeah, Sunday, but Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, you can go on my website and you can pull it up. Remember when the scripture says, and he gave gifts to men, first of he gave apostles, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors. Let's let's briefly look at that. Apostles did not rule the church, did not run the church, they did not govern the church. What they did was they they with the evangelists, with the company of their prophets, started the work. Preach the word of God, true, as to the apostles and prophets and evangelists. But when the apostles were moved by God to go to another place, they put the evangelists there. So when the apostles left, the evangelists set up. And what the evangelist's job is, is to continue to set up and train men. They trained men. When these men reached the point of being thoroughly trained, they moved out. And then those men who was trained became the elders, permanent elders, which what we have right now today. Okay. The apostles were gifted men with divine revelation, divine signs and wonders and miracles, which only they had with the prophets. They didn't have the books, the collective books of Old and New Testament at their grips like we can go here and like that. And this divine revelation. God spoke to the prophets. God spoke to the apostles. And to authenticate that what they said, they had signs, wonders, and miracles to authenticate that God spoke to them. And whatever the prophets and the apostles spoke, it was 100%. It wasn't 99, it wasn't 98, it wasn't 89. It, everything they spoke, they confirmed it with signs, wonders, and miracles that proved that God had sent them. That's how you can detect in the early church, in the Old Testament, whether God sent that person. Jesus used the method when he came and started collecting guys, which was 12 of them, and trained them. One of them was Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord. The 11 went to travel to Jerusalem. When they got to Jerusalem, it was they said, well, it is important that we put somebody in Judas' place. But whoever we put in Judas' place had to have been with us since the time of John the Baptist baptizing the Lord. There it is in Acts chapter 1. So they chose the guy, Scripture says in Acts chapter 1, because he'd been with them since the beginning. And that's one of the marks of an apostle, that you had to have been with Jesus since his baptism. What apostle today or prophet today been with Jesus. It's 2,000 years ago, come on. Let's, let's, let's look at what the scripture says. So these spiritual, there needs to be a spiritual development of leading men in the church, which are called 
pastors, teachers, elders, bishops today. How the church is run, it is so, so important that these men be fully equipped because you got to guard, protect, feed, lead, guide, narrative. All these things you have to do as elders, as plurality, a collective of elders within the church. Now, I know as many churches that um, you may have, right at the beginning, have one elder or two elders. God will bless as time go by. But don't feel as though that you are the senior guy and the other guy, elders or juniors. The Bible doesn't support that. When you get your book here in uh, uh, Biblical Eldership here on page uh, 12, we're looking at an explanation of Biblical Eldership. It says, despite all the New Testament what the New Testament, all what the New, all, excuse me, despite all the New Testament says about church elders, the church, the subject has deeply been misunderstood and ignored. Many evangelical churches that sincerely claim to base their church structure on holy scriptures do not even have a body of elders. These churches have ignored the pastoral oversight of the church by a polarity of elders a concept plainly set forth in the scriptures. Even most Presbyterian churches and others that claim to be governed by a scriptural priority of elders has defined church eldership so that its original purpose and noble standing here in practice has been eclipsed by the ordained minister and his staff. So you have one ordained minister and his staff. That sort of sound, sound like a business, doesn't it? Some, there are six things that we're going to cover in the explanation and defense of biblical eldership. We're going to look at him being a humble and uh, servant as, as his character shared oversight, non-clerical structure, scripture qualifications, male leadership, and congregation submission. We're going to briefly look at each one, and each one of these has a chapter towards them. Um, the Bible does knows nothing about a one man minister and his staff, his staff. It's amazing. Upon this rock, I build my church. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the senior pastor has taken over. He's the one that pulls all the shots. And it's, it's, it's a plurality of elders. Apostolic practice and teaching as revealed in the New Testament church, it clearly reveals that pastoral oversight of many of the first churches was committed to a council of elders. This was true of the earliest Christ Jewish Christian churches in Jerusalem. Remember, it started in Jerusalem, the book of Acts. And in Judea and neighboring countries, as well as many of the first Gentile churches. Now, to prove that, I'm going to read something from the scriptures. I'm going to read it here, but it's authenticated and validated by the scriptures. Barnabas and Saul gave offering for Judah, Judea's poor to the elders. Acts 11 to 30. The elders at Jerusalem united with the 12 apostles to deliberate over doctrinal controversy. Problem rose up. Acts chapter 15. The biblical record reveals oversight by the plurality of elders in the churches of Derby, Lostra, Icodium, Antioch, Acts 14.23. In the church of Ephesus, Acts 20.17, 1 Timothy 3 and chapter 5. 
the church at Philippi, Philippi chapter 1. The churches on the Isle of Crete, Titus 1 and 5. According to Peter, the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithany, 1 Peter 1 and 1, chapter 5, verse 1. Both the apostles, Paul and Peter, directly charge the elders of the church to pastor or shepherd and oversee in a local congregation, Acts 20, 28, and 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. At both the beginning and the end of Paul's ministry, he appointed a polarity of elders to care for the churches he planted, Acts 14, 23, Titus 1 and 5. According to Titus 1 and 5 passages, Paul did not consider the church to be fully developed until it had functional, qualified elders. What, it, what was happening in on the Isle of Crete, which had many members, Paul left Titus there as an evangelist to train and set up men for the churches. Now, as, as you record, as it is in record, I'm turning. Acts 20, 28. He said, for this reason, left I you in creed that ye may set in order the things that are wanting See, there was a need, as it is a need in churches. You may have a gathering in Nigeria, a gathering in Guam, a gathering in Australia, a gathering in Liverpool, England, a gathering in Chicago, Illinois. People gather together, but they don't have an elder. A church, a gathering, ecclesia, a congregate of people must have an elder because the sole purpose of the elder is to teach, to protect, to shepherd, to God, to lead the people. Because the people are not able. You're going to be scattered. You're going to be scattered. So Paul says to Titus, I left you in creed that you set in order the things that are warning and ordain elders in every city as I appointed you. So, Paul the Apostle, and I remember now, the evangelists worked with the apostles in the early church. Uh, now, you may call yourself an evangelist today, but don't, don't feel as though that you, you have to hook up with an apostle or do signs and miracles just like the apostles, prophet, and evangelists did the back then. That's not going to be the case. And the evangelists nowadays simply spread the word, establish the church, train men, same function. After that men is trained, they leave. They set them up, ordain them. And that's what Titus did. Ordain elders in every church, in every city, as I appointed you. So Paul taught Titus the methodology of training men. So you see, there were men in, scattered out in the congregate of assembly who qualified. It's like the scriptures would say, look among you men that has these qualifications. Remember what it says about the deacon, full of the Holy Spirit, so when Titus saw these men, he says, I'm just using names for argument's sake. He says, he said, uh, uh, Philip, uh, Bartholomew, and, 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 and Kristen, and he just named them and said, now, you guys are showing forth great potentials, and you're, you're meeting the qualifications that Paul gave me a list of, and I would like for you to, you know, See, the reason why Titus did these to these men in these congregations was because they were already moved by the Holy Spirit 
to be called into the ministry, but they needed that sudden push and that 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 push from Titus or Paul that says, indeed, let me train you. This is the pattern. This is the characteristics. This is the procedure. And this is what Paul told Titus to do. Now notice what it says. I'm, 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 I'm repeating for a purpose. I left you in Crete. That's the reason. For this reason, I left you in Crete because Paul knew by the inspiration, divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that there were men scattered in the various cities who could take on the responsibilities of being leading elders in the church. Titus, as an evangelist, his job was to train those men that Paul says. And most likely, Paul gave them the list of those men. And Titus sought them out. At the same time, the Lord moved upon these men for the ministry. So Paul says, if any be, be blameless, the husband of one wife, and he just lists them. These same men who received the calling and the urgency that it, 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 it had to take place because, you know, it's not the thing like many men and women were used to, be, well, somebody got to do it. Men ain't doing it, so us women got to do it. No, 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 no. That's that's not that's not the issue here. They were called by God. Titus approached them and said, "Look, Paul gave me your names, and you are very prominent in the community, and you're very structured in teaching, and you know the scriptures. See, there's there's there were signs, there were characteristics that was pointing to them to fulfill." That in Titus, the need need to be met in those communities, as the need is being met in your community. But you don't want to you 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 don't want to rush into it because you don't want to make mistakes. Now I'm not saying that I or anyone else is perfect in the ministry because no one is perfect. But it will be less mistakes likely you will make if you're thoroughly trained by someone like Titus or an evangelist or a pastor or an elder in your church, in your community, in that seminar, in that class, in that university, in that structure. That's the format. See, because before this, before Timothy and Titus, the Lord will speak to you in a vision, in a voice, and he will call you. He will call you and you will hear his voice like you will hear me. You will sit there with your eyes open and you will have a vision and God will appear to you, Jesus Christ, and say, I have called you, I want you to preach my word. That does not happen today. That cannot happen today. That will not happen today because of the scriptures. The format today is that the men who are called by the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit moves within a man's heart and mind and gives them the call. And within that calling, they will reveal to others or the elder in the church that I know that the Lord is calling me. The, a responsible elder, a responsible pastor would say, you know what? Here are some alternatives. I can set it up for you to go to the university such and such, and the church will pay you can take this this online course that I know of that will help you or we can set up with one of the elders or my, I myself as an elder to train you and we can meet once or twice a week 
for one to two years, and we'll see how you go with that, and we'll take it from there. He has to make the decision what he wants. Now, suppose you are not in a church that the pastor or the elders can approach you and say, we're going to send you to university such and such. We're going to send you up to Europe. We're going to send you to Ghana. We're going to send you to America. We, you know, Financially, they're not able. So you have to decide and say, well, I know I need to train. I know I need to train. I need to start demonstrating the character, the domestic character, the spiritual characteristic, and, uh, and the mental characteristic as stated in Titus and Timothy before people will see me as a true elder. And I got to get the training under my belt. But you see, now mark this now. Before the scriptures of Timothy and Titus came, the evangelists, prophets, and apostles, with the elders in the early church, they didn't have this. It was divine revealing, visions, signs, and wonders that the Lord showed the man that he was called of him, and he gifted him with these signs to prove to people they don't are. Now, the signs and wonders and miracles to prove that you are. What are they today is the scriptures. The scripture says to speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. Elders are taught by men by the power of the Holy Spirit today and not vindicated by miracles, signs, and wonders. The elders today are directed by the Holy Spirit who uses other men to train them. I'm making this very plain because I don't want you to think that it takes a vision from God. It takes a voice from God. Now, Let's say that you did receive a vision and you did receive a voice that said to, to go and preach the gospel. You need to back up. You need to back up and sit in prayer with a responsible elder and find out what is going on. Because you're going outside of the scriptures. When you say you heard God's voice in your bedroom, in your kitchen, on your job saying, go and preach my word. Or you receive a vision from God. Because you, you're going against the scriptures. And the scriptures cannot be broken. Throughout the Old and New Testament, is the prophets, even Jesus says, thus the scriptures cannot be broken. God authenticates his message through the scriptures today. God, in sundry times, Hebrews 1 and 1, in diverse manners, various places, spoke to the fathers of the Old Testament. Old Testament all the way down to Pentecost, all the way down to the early church of the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists. He spoke by means of the prophet through signs and wonders and miracles. But now in these latter days, he speaks to us through his son, the word. See, that's the whole point of God saying, Paul, the signs, sun, miracles, and wonders is going to die out. They're going to cease. The tongue's going to cease. The full knowledge and all what I've given to you guys as apostles and prophets is going to vanish. Knowledge is going to vanish away. And all those things was in part. But now I want you to put in record down what the church need to follow. So Paul wrote the epistles. John wrote his epistles. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, which is combustion. Uh, Revelation is just from Genesis to the end of the age. John repeats everything from Genesis to Revelation in his book, The Revelations, history. P. 
Peter, First Peter, Second Peter, Jude, the Book of Jude, hmm. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Gospel of Mark, Luke, Luke's Gospel, the Book of Acts. So we follow what the Scripture says. We don't follow signs. We don't follow wonders. We don't follow miracles. We don't deal with raising the dead, seances, tricks, magics, and whatever. We deal only with the authoritative word of God only because God reveals himself through his word. God speaks through his word. The voice that you hear, my sheep, hear my voice, is the word of God. It's not a voice that you hear Now, on page 20 of our book, page 20 of our book, Biblical Eldership, some of you are so multi-talented, multi-gifted as elders, and some of you are not. Some of you can teach and well-equipped to pastor and shepherd more so than others, but never look down upon your other brother as an elder who cannot do what you do because your skills is needed by his skills and you work together in that congregation. The big question that's always arise when discussing eldership is who leads the elders? The book has to stop with one person, not a board. Didn't Israel have only one deliverer at the time, like Moses or David? Everyone knows that one man rule is the most effective. That's not what the scripture says. That's, no, no, that's not what the scripture says. See, you're, you're looking at uh, a government by ruled by God. It's called theocracy. In the church, it's not only a government ruled by God, but ruled through God through men. Not one man, not a senior pastor, but men. Not a clergy of a higher rank. And under him are priests and other guys or whatever that I don't know where to get the where to get nuns and stuff like that from. I mean, this is far fetched. It's been contended that one man provides leadership for the congregation. And that one man is the clergy, the reverend. And he's the one that is the professional. The scripture does not teach that. The New Testament scriptures, however, neither authorize nor speak of such a sacred person who rules over the saints of God. This concept is foreign to the gospel and the assemblies established by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, previously, I already read you different aspects of how that Paul states that the elders are stewards for, of the household managers of the local assembly, Titus chapter 1 and 7. We went over earlier, this is page 14, I'm backing up, how that the elders, Peter warned the elders against um, being too authoritative. Elders are men placed in the church as overseers by the Holy Spirit, elders. Elders must be qualified before they serve as elders. Wow. So the Bible does not know of one person that's dominating the scene. 
the one professional. No, there are many professionals. Many professionals. And that means many elders, a plurality of elders that help. Do we think we are wiser and more intelligent than the apostles of Jesus Christ? Do we think that we would establish a form of oversight that would be inferior or ineffective? There were good reasons why the apostles avoided a one-man oversight, which was very common in their day and very common today. Many people falsely pit local church eldership against the special deliverer or charismatic, multi-gifted leader favoring the single elder. And that's why in these prosperity churches and many ministries today, there's one person that shines out. Oh, he got other guys sitting in the audience, sitting in the back of him or other elders, but he's the one that shines out. He's the professional. He's the one that the spotlight is showing to. This is wrong. Scriptures know nothing about that. Moses, however, was, as I stated earlier about Moses, Moses was a one-time unique person. There'll never be another Moses. There'll never be another Apostle Peter or Apostle Paul. Okay. Scripture proves to us in the book of Acts, as we see in the book of Acts, beginning with chapter 12, 13, that when they came together, they came together as elders to 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 meet that congress that uh, controversial problems that came up in the church. At that time, at that time, the apostle Peter was the, uh, excuse me, apostle James was uh, leading the council in the early church in Jerusalem. And the problem came up, but they did not approach Peter; they approached James. Peter did have something to say as well as the other apostles and prophets, but James were the presiding elder there in the council. That's in the book of Acts. Most people don't realize, on page uh, 22, most people don't realize that biblical eldership actually combines the very the best of both leadership structure. An exceptional gifted leader can lead and teach with all his zeal and might, yet he is subject to his fellow leaders and brothers who jointly lead and guide the congregation. Now, S Sunday passed, Sunday evening just passed, we were preaching from the, doing expository preaching from the book of Mark, and uh, we close with this. Uh, as Jesus was heading the group towards Jerusalem, the apostles, John and James, rushed up front to speak with Jesus. James and John says, Lord, we want to ask something of you. Jesus says, what do you want to ask? They say, Lord, my brother and I, both of us, one of us want to sit on the left and on the right when you, when you establish your kingdom. See, they still have this kingdom thing in their mind. Even in the book of Acts chapter 1, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom? Jesus probably shook his head and said, boy, these guys, they ain't, they ain't learned yet, but they did learn. Okay, it took time, as it takes time for us to learn that, okay? But they asked the Peter, James and John said, we want to sit on your left and sit on the right. See, ego and pride and thinking that because I know more scripture than someone else or I can speak better than another elder or because I'm knowledgeable in that, that I, I should be the senior pastor because I know more. I'm, I'm, el I'm, I'm older, I'm mature, and but it doesn't work like that. And you see, some congregation, they pick their leaders like that, or because the pastor's son, you know, 
he inherited the church. It doesn't work like that either. And if he doesn't have a church, he, he, he doesn't have a son, his daughter or his wife take over. That's not scripture either. There's no combined husband and wife team. Where do we get this from? We're acting like the government of the world, of society, of culture. The, co the way the government, the culture, and society run their business and their policy is it should not be brought into the church. The church is structured different. That's why it's called the church. <laughs> the church. Okay. But we got our board members and we got we got motivated speakers. We got People coming in from Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and whatever, the signs and wonders and miracles, and a prophet here, an apostle here, to come and boost the crowd up, to make get more money coming in, to whatever. This is wrong. And the scripture doesn't authenticate this. We're, we're to jointly work together as elders in the church to God, to protect, to feed, to shepherd the flock of God and much more. There's a dark side to the super pastor concept that is seldom talked about in the church. The superstar approach is, wrong, is a wrong model. It's, it's a wrong model. Furthermore, when ruled by a superstar pastor or evangelist or prophet, qualified men remain in spiritual infancy rather than growing into maturity as they share in the oversight of the church. Those guys that sit in the back, when you watch on TV, social media, in your own churches or somebody else's church that you visit, they're not growing because the spotlight is never on them. They don't get, they don't contribute. They don't, they're not out in front. See, the point is not being all the time out in front is that you're sharing the ministry with the other elders. You're not all the time in the spotlight because you smile or got great teeth or you're well educated and you know a lot of Hebrew and Greek or you have been taught and you went to a well-established university or Bible college, and that make you more prominent than your other elders in the church. This is wrong. Whether you have a cert certification, a diploma, a doctor in divinity, a doctor, a master's or a bachelor or an associate or credits, if you are called by God, you are on the same standard as that doctorate degree person. They may know more in you, but they are not elevated above you. So don't feel as though because of who they are, who they are, how much training and books they have, and they are have a leading uh, church with many members. You may have one, two, or your family as, and you're pastoring them or eldershipping them. You are doing a great job as equal capacity to a man that has 2,200 people. 24 elders, been in the ministry for 50, 40, 30 years. You are on the same level in the sight of God as them because you have been called by God. Never feel that your ministry is inferior to another man's ministry because of what they have because they've been in the ministry for a long time, because they have a doctorate and you're working on your thesis or you don't have money to go to a university or, and you've never been introduced to a seminar class or you don't have the education. We 
when God called you into your ministry, he will provide. So that's why you need not to rush into your ministry. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. I say unto you, wait. The Lord will provide you with adequate enough teaching so you will fit in with the other elders that you will be able to begin with your family or with friends in your living room, in your apartment, in your house, in the garage, in the park, in the woods, in a building on the second floor, in a school, in an auditorium, wherever God set you up at, be faithful. In the word of God, speak the things that become sound doctrine. We're going to close out. When we come back, we're going to look at chapter 2, the elder being a humble servant of God. Father, we thank you for this blessed lesson in eldership. May those who are seeking, those who are, may be, have been strengthened somewhat by the power of the Holy Spirit. May they be encouraged to push on and continue on. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And don't forget, Biblical Eldership, Chapter 2, tomorrow, we are going to be moving into other portions of Jesus Christ, Prince of Preachers, and Acts chapter 20. Awesome. Thank God. We're going to break now for our third course, dealing with Jesus Christ, Christology, the life and times of Jesus, with his examining his person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to take the time to go over it. You can sign in. Uh, and my email address, or you can send a message on Facebook to me on my Facebook page, Sherman Harris. This is our office phone number you may call. When we going to do Zoom, this is my number. Again, the books and material are free, and uh, we want you to be encouraged as you take these courses. Our next course, we'll be dealing with Jesus and his times. This is the book that we'll be uh, using. With this book, we'll be using the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. What we're going to discover in this course, in order to enhance your understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ, because nothing happened in a vacuum, what I mean by that. This was during the time of the Roman Empire. We're going to concentrate on the time of the Greek and Roman Empire. So, in a sense, we're going to be dealing with the history, historical perspective before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and after the time of Christ. 
going to be looking at mainly focusing on Matthews and Luke, not Mark, because, see, Mark gospel is a gospel of servanthood, that Christ came to be a servant. As you know, a servant, a slave, uh, doesn't have a background doesn't have an inheritance. He's a servant. Jesus took upon himself as being a servant. And he came and died and was buried and rose again. Not saying that Mark is insufficient or is, we're going to leave it out, but Matthew and Luke is going to bring out the dominant teachings of our lesson. Wherein John's gospel is going to bring out his deity, his person. Not that Mark doesn't. Mark, Mark is part of the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel, true. But as you search and study, you're going to find out that a whole lot in dealing with Jesus as being the Jewish Messiah is extraordinarily brought out in the book of Matthew. Jesus, the Old Testament prophet, as well as Isaiah, Micah 5 and 2, thou Bethlehem of Judea, out of you, the least of the tribe, out of you shall come a savior, a deliverer. These prophecies, way back to the, the very first one, the seed of the woman, Genesis chapter 3, leads to Jesus Christ being both God and Messiah. And that's the whole part, of course, that we're going to look at in Christology. Christology is the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But while we're studying the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we want to look at the background of of Jesus' times, before he came and during his time. It's so important. It's important to know what, who are the Samaritans, who are the Pharisees, the, who is Herod, his sons. Which Herod can we identify in the life of John the Baptist, Jesus, and the apostles? There's different Herods. Who are the Pharisees, who are the scribes, the priests? Who was the zealots? There's many places, many people that we have to look at to understand, to bring on Christ, the Messiah. So we look at the law, we look at the writings, and we look at the prophets, which makes up the Old Testament. The, 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 the prophets, the writings, the law, the prophets, the law, and the writings. I'm not putting them in order, but those are the three that makes up the law and deals with the five books of Moses, the prophets, which we have categorized former or major and minor because they knew each other in certain years and perspective. Uh, you'll be surprised. Then you have the writings, which is the poetic books, and you have the historical books. The key writers that we may focus on is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Nehemiah, and Ezra. These are the major prophets. Wherein their contemporaries, who were Habakkuk and Micah and Nahum and Zephaniah and Zechariah and the rest of them, Malachi, they joined in with these major prophets. They knew each other as they wrote the scripture. So as we set the stage to uh, begin with the writings here, as far as the uh, life of Jesus, we're going to sort of turn our Bibles to uh, the book of Luke. And we're going to sort of compare it with 
put my finger in here and go back to Matthew uh, chapter 1. And these are two of the crucial portions of scriptures that we're going to be with in uh, a couple of weeks because we want to look at. Because as we look at Matthew, uh, which is the Jewish perspective of the Messiah as compared to Luke's message of the Messiah, of the Son of God. Though they vary in different in words, it's, they're, they're coming out. They're going to come out more so in the same. So I'm, I'm folding my page here because I want to first address Matthew. Now, before we look at these scriptures here in Matthew chapter 1, you turn there, right, and then look at, put your marker or pen or something in Luke or fold the page like I did, because we're going to flip over to Luke chapter 1 also. We want you to see that within Matthews that there are, there are, there are two families really going to be involved here because of David. The two sons of David, Nathan and Solomon, because of Joseph and Mary. And they both come from different sons under the sons of, of Christ, David. But let's look at what Matthew says. The book, the scrolls, of the literature or the generation of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. The word Christ, Christos, is Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Savior, that's his name. He's the son of David, who is a prominent character of the Messiahship to bring on the Messiah as well as the son of Abraham. Now we all know who David and Abraham was. You know through the scriptures in Genesis about Abraham, his faith and the deeds and the things that he did, the life that he lived. We know about David. And neither men were perfect. Neither men were, were perfect. You know that, right? You know what David did. You know what Abraham did. God don't choose perfect people. God chooses sinners and changes them and transforms them and converts them. Let's look at verse 2. So Matthew says, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judas. His brother. Judas begot, and then, then, it, then after Judas, Matthew is going to key in on the tribe on Judas, the son, the, 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 the lad, boy, the child Judas. Not tribe, because there wasn't no tribe there. Okay? But Judas. And Judas, verse 3, begot Perez and Zara of Tamar, and Perez begot Ezram, and Ezram begot Ebram, Ebram begot Abinadad, Abinadad begot, now, if, to the average person, I guess this is, you feel this is a waste of time. But you got to understand, all scripture is given by inspiration both the old and the new. It goes back to, like we were saying, church history, world history. People just don't like world history or U.S. history. They just don't like, they don't like politics or government. But this is important because it's the lineage of Jesus Christ. So let's move on. Verse uh, 4 again. Abraham begot Abinadab, Abinadab begot Nassam, Nassam begot Solomon, 
Salman begat bows of Rakhat, and bows begat Obe of Ruth. Obe begot Jesse. Now, this this brings in the story of, of, of Ruth. And I hope you had a reading in the book of Ruth because this is what's coming out now. And Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king. And David the king begot Solomon. Now, David had many sons. I think he had just one daughter. But he had many sons. He had one son with long, gorgeous hair, and he wanted to take over. He couldn't even wait for his father to die. He wanted to take over. That's two of them, I get, right? But here it says, David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. You know who that was, Bathsheba. So Matthew is reminding us of what David did, the murder, the sin, the adulteries. Okay, Solomon begot Roboam. Roboam begot Abiah. Abiah begot Asha, Asa begot Just Josaphat, Josaphat begot Joam, Joam begot Ozias, Ozias begot Jothan, and Jothan begot Echaz, Echaz begot Ezekias, Ezekias begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amman, Amman begot Joseas, Joseas begot Jehoneas and his brother about the time they were carried away to Babylon. After we were brought to Babylon, Jeconus begot Lot's woo, Salathenia, Salathiel, Salathiel begot Zor, I'm trying to break these in syllables now, Zorobiel, Zorobiel begat Abihu, Abihu begot Eklahim, Eklahim begot Azor, Azor begot Sada, Sada begot Ekim, Ekim begot Elu, Elu begot Elizazar, Elizazar begot Methane, Methane begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph. Now you notice the Jake, the begot stops there. Yeah. See that in verse 16? Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. It didn't say Joseph begot Jesus. See, because if it was, it, it couldn't be an incarnation of virgin birth. It was so vital that the virgin birth be holy of God and not of man. Man has nothing to do with it. The seed of Joseph did not was not plant into Mary. Because the seed of Joseph is corrupt. The seed of Joseph is sinful. The seed of Joseph is, is ungodly. And had that seed had been in, went into Mary, into the fallopian tube, and, 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 and mixed with her, with all the chromosomes and all that, then when life conceived, that child at that early stage of life, yes, I say life, would have been a corrupt sinner. Hmm. So, the scripture says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Messiah, the anointed one. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14, from David unto the carrying away of Babylon, 14, and from the carrying away of Babylon unto the Messiah is 14. So those, you have those generations. That's why Matthew begins, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now, pause there and flip over to Luke. Now, before what happened in verse 18 of Matthews 1 and 18, Luke has to be looked at right here. 
So in chapter one of our book, we see the birth of the Savior, and we begin. We go, it, it begins with chapter two, true, true. Okay. But I want to look at history before the birth of Jesus. What brought about that? Things that happened before Jesus. The man Jesus came incarnated. The God man came and became a man. Emmanuel, God with us. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. Mighty God. Prince of peace. Okay? So, so when we're dealing with Christology, we're dealing with the pre existence of Jesus Christ also. He exists before Matthew's gospel, Luke gospel. He exists as God. He was known as, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. He is known as Jehovah, Yahweh, in the Old Testament. Now, what had happened was, word had got back to Luke by one of his choice friends, Theophilus, because he wanted a complete record of all of historical perspective of the Messiah, Jesus. And he wanted that information to read over, which is nothing wrong with that. So what Luke did is Luke gathered the materials from Old Testament times, the prophets, the writings, poems, poetic books, you know, Job all the way up to uh, you know, Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. He gathered the information from the prophets. He gathered information from the writings. He gathered information from the law. My books of Moses, the law. And this is the reason why he said, for much as many have taken in hand to set in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among the Jewish people. Even as they delivered unto them unto us, which from the beginning were apoptized, the word, I just pronounced the Greek word, which is the English word, eyewitnesses. Our eyewitness is a person on the scene who examined and cut it up. And see, that's where the wise the Greek word is optoptis, and eyewitnesses. They see, they heard, they know, they had first hand. That's an eyewitness. So the law, the prophets, the writings, all the optoptis, the eyewitnesses, and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also having perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto you in order most excellent Theophilus. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judah, Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Now, here we go with two people. We got to know who. And, 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 and that's the reason why I, um, I, I sort of chose this book. I'm moving towards pages now. Uh, the, the history of this guy and his family of uh, uh, Herod's, I mean, it's magnificent. It's, well, I say magnificent because history-wise, uh, it is magnificent because Herod had, there was the father who had sons, and uh, the sons, the, the, the Herod, Herod was, a, was, was a mean guy. <laughs> Not only had his sons were too, then, but the Herod family, boy, I had to turn way into the book, into the 53rd uh, page to get this, the Herod family. Um, Herod
Thirdly, this Herod mentioned here, Herod the king of Judea. Now, in order to understand, see, this is why as a minister or as a teacher, you have to labor in a biblical history and, and look at not only biblical history, but ancient history, whether it's Babylonian, Roman, Greek, all sorts. Um, you have to understand the Roman history in Rome. You got to go all the way back to Pompeii, who met up with uh, you know Julius Caesar at that time, uh, to understand all these writings of Matthew and Luke, and how it became an empire. Eventually, it broke into the eastern side, the west side, and everything in the AD 300 and whatever, even earlier than that. But at this particular time, the world was dominated by Rome, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire reaches around what we call Europe, all around to the, uh, and, it, and engulf the upper part of Africa and it over to its you know, um, Egypt. It took in the Mediterranean Sea. And it was ruled by a king. The word king is Caesar. The word Caesar means king. And um, under him, there were men that ruled the nation under Caesar. One of them was Herod, who had favor at that time with, with the Caesar at that time, and he didn't want to mess up. The days of Herod, Herod the Great ruled over Judea, Galilee, Perea, and Syria from 37 to 4 BC. This was the Herod that, you know, killed the children. In uh, you know, in that time in Bethlehem, and he killed the children, trying to stop the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, now, before him, that he had a father who was the Idumean, I D M I D U M E A N. He was called an Antipater the second, the Adubiae. He married Cyprus, whom he poisoned in 43 BC. He had one, two, three, four, five. He had four sons and one daughter. The greatest of the sons was Herod the Great, whom we are talking about here. What Herod the Great did was he killed his brother. He killed his brother in 40 BC. He killed Joseph, his brother, in 38 BC. He poisoned his other brother, and uh, by chance, his sister Salom, Salome died, and um, you know he didn't have no problem with her. And he took over, and that's why it says in the days of Herod the king, he ruled Judea. He ruled Judea. This was the king, Herod, that Joseph feared because, you know, he went to Egypt. Because the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, take your son and go to Egypt. And uh, Herod was just, you know, trying to stop the birth of Jesus. But something else happened months ahead of time before the birth of Jesus. That was the birth of John the Baptist, his cousin. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, that there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the house, right, of the court, excuse me, I say house, it says the course of Abiah. Now, they were priests. Now, 
in the priesthood, each priest, which was 70 of them, they had certain duties that they had to perform in a cycle. And each cycle, they had to do certain duties in the temple, outside of the temple, you know, in that area of the temple. And that's why it says of the course of Abaya. Now, Abaya was a household that had its certain duties. He was the head priest. And within that household, there was other priests that were subject to, the, to, to, if I can make you understand, a greater priest, a form of words. And they had duties to perform. Now, if you Google or look up the temple site, there was much to do. And all these priests had a whole lot to do. And they, they their lives was dedicated to the temple. But each course, each family had their duties to perform. Zacharias of the course of Abiah and his wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now stricken in years, you know, well up in years, very aged. So aged that they couldn't have children past that time. So it came to pass while Zechariah executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. So Zechariah's course of order for his household was to take turns in going in and burning incense, according to verse 9. Another priest, uh, let me get my, my, my paper here, another priest went in and took care of the altar. Another priest family took care of the uh, the table of showbread. Each one, altar of incense, each each one had its course. And it took a course, and they change up during the year or months within. But according to the custom of the priest's office, see, each priest's office had a custom, an order, a course to perform. Zachariah's family was in charge of burning the incense. That's all what they did. That was their duty. And you had, and according to the Old Testament, you had to do it right. That takes you back to the times of Aaron's sons. Remember, one of Aaron's sons burnt strange fire, and God smote him. See the. When Moses got the word from God and said, this is how you are to burn incense. This is how you have to set up the altar. This is how you have to carry the tabernacle. This is, see, everything was set in order, and you had to do precisely what was <clears throat> told to Moses from God. And Moses told the people, the priests, and the, see, the priests did this. And they knew better. They had to do everything right. See, it's the same way in the church. You just can't flip flamming and do anything in the church, whatever, anybody. That's why Paul says, how come some of you have a song, have a revelation, and this? He said, let everything be done in decency and order. Everybody standing up testifying, speaking in tongues, doing this and doing that. No order, no structure. Doing what you want to do. First Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says no. God, the Holy Spirit doesn't act unseen. As it was in the Old Testament, it's still in the New Testament. There's need to be order in worship. So, he went into the temple to perform this duty, his family. And the whole multitude of people were praying about at the time of the incense. While Zechariah was in there lighting the incense, 
and other priests was doing their duty, but his seems to be the most important at that time. Now, whether they did it consecutive or whatever, each one, each priest's order or whatever, everybody was glued to what Zachariah was doing. Incense, to burn incense, to gain favor with God. The whole multitude was praying without at the time of the incense. But while Aaron was doing this, an angel of the Lord appeared on the right side of the altar of the incense. So it's like Aaron was there and he was lighting and he was doing what he had to do. The angel of the Lord appeared. Now that Angel of the Lord, you gotta you gotta know specifically in the Old Testament, which is this is part of it too. This we're still under the old covenant at this point. Uh, you gotta distinguish in the Old Testament writings when the scripture says the angel of the Lord, according to the context, you gotta distinguish whether it's talking about the, the pre-appearing of Jesus Christ before his time versus just an angel coming. This is just an angel. It wasn't Jesus pre-incarnate. It's going to tell you why, who it is, actually. Notice, let's read. The angel of the Lord is standing on the right side of the altar in the incense. And when Zechariah saw the angel, he was troubled and fell upon and, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayers, your prayer is heard. See, as he was offering incense, he was praying, as the people were outside was praying. They wasn't allowed to come in. They was praying outside. Zechariah was praying, and the incense was being offered. Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You shall have, go you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's he said, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then say John had he was God incarnate. Many thought John was the Messiah. See the difference, the difference is that Zacharias and and Elizabeth came together and had a son. What's impossible with man is possible with God. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Now, God could have chose a younger couple. God could have chose a much older, younger couple. But he chose Zachariah and Elizabeth. John was not born sinless. There was only one person born sinless and perfect. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the scripture says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. So John, from the mother's womb, received, you know, the Holy Spirit. Such an early life, early age, I'm going to put it that way. But he was not sinless. It was not God in Elizabeth as God was in Christ. God was in Mary. See, there's a difference. So you got two women, two pregnancies. You got two fathers, Zachariah and Joseph. You got two women pregnant, the Elizabeth and Mary. You got two babies, John and Jesus. But Jesus was born of the seed of the Holy Spirit. 
John was born of Elizabeth and, and, and Zachariah, but the Spirit of God filled him in the womb. That is not the same as being the seed of God, which is the Holy Spirit. That holy thing that is in you is of the Holy Spirit, Mary. Zachariah's seed went into Elizabeth. Joseph's seed did not go into Mary. John was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Jesus was not. He was impeccable. Impeccable. No sin. That's what that means. Without sin. The impeccability of Christ. He could not sin. He had no sin nature. He could not think evil, know evil in that perspective of being caused in his body. Impeccability. John was not. John was born of a, of a woman through the same means in which everyone is born. As the angel was explaining to Zacharias about John, what he's going to do, his duties, he's going to come with the spirit and the power of Elias, that's Elijah, and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready the people for the prepared for the Lord. Now, this was prophesied. I'm going back. The greatest of all these prophecies is the book of Malachi. Some pronounce it Malachi. In, this, in the book of Malachi, or Malachi, whichever way you want to pronounce it, it says, Behold, chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger. See, the word messenger is Malach. Malach. Yeah, Malak, Malak, M-A-L-A-K, Malak. That's the Hebrew word. The Old Testament Hebrew word is messenger. Okay? In the New Testament, it is pronounced angelos, angelos, which is the Greek word for messenger. Behold, I send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So you got two messengers in this, this chapter here. One is the messenger that's going to prepare the way for the messenger. The messenger, which is the Lord of hosts. Let me read again. Malachi 3 and 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me, the Lord, whom ye seek. He shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight. And behold, he shall come, says Jehovah of hosts. This is the Messiah. Now, back to Luke chapter 1, verse 18. Zechariah, a, a man thoroughly taught in the priesthood, know the law, the scriptures, he understands truth. But he questioned the angel. He said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Now, I can imagine, well, Gabriel got angry. He got upset. I mean, you sit back and you look at Exodus. Genesis, Exodus, which 
Zechariah was very familiar with. He was very familiar with the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Samuel. But yet he questioned the words of the angel, uh, Gabriel. He says, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and speak to unto thee and to show you these glad tidings, the gospel, the good news. Hmm. You shall become dumb and shall not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be fulfilled because you believe not my words. Now, to make it short, uh, <laughs> when, he, when he came out past the veil, you know, whether to bless the people, to say the prayer. Or not. See, they was discussing, the they, they, they was waiting for Zachariah to come out. And it didn't take that long. It, it, it wasn't supposed to take that long to go in the temple, do, do your job, and come back out because the people was waiting. But he took a long time. So there was a conversation going on. I mean, I don't know if they saw the light coming from the, the, the veil or whatever, but they, they realized that Zachariah was taking a long time coming back. The guy was petrified. Not to the point that he couldn't speak, but he was fearful, scared, to that point. And the angel of the Lord comforted him by saying, fear not, I'm bringing you a messenger, I'm bringing you the gospel, I'm bringing you good tidings, I'm bringing you good news. And because you didn't receive it, as you're supposed to have, you're going to be dumb until this thing happens. So. He came out and he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. In the temple, for he beckoned unto them. And remained speechless, with his hands, with his head, he beckoned. And it came to pass, as soon as the days of the ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. So he goes home. He goes home uh, and relaxes. And he probably <laughs> most likely told us the Elizabeth. Now that brings back to Matthew chapter 1, which we're going to come back to tomorrow and look at because our time is gone. Because now we're going to correspond with both uh, scripture readings on the birth of Jesus, how it is, it's, it's a king as we started in uh, Luke and then as we started in Matthew and now here it is. So Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 and here in Luke chapter uh, 1 verse uh, 27. We're going to look at that and correspond it. Okay? Again, our book is the Holy Scriptures with Jesus and his Father, we thank you for the, the course on Christology, taking it in an expository teaching method to present the life of Jesus Christ before he came, the way of living, his culture, his society standing, his person and work. We pray, Father, that as we examine this, that it will increase our faith, increase our desire to know him even more. And we bless your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we close completely, again, I'd like to reiterate, on Facebook, the lessons will be on Facebook, and I'm going to send it to YouTube, but at the same time, on Facebook, Sherman Harris, my email address, send it to me, your email address, and let me know that you're interested, and we'll be sending you all the materials as we go by, and we'll, we'll send it to you. Or 
you can, in your email address, if you have not, you say, well, I prefer to have a copy of a book or a copy of, okay, then you need to send us your address so we can send you that material. All books and materials are free. And uh, the phone number, or you can call the office here. Uh, you can call, and we're, we're uh, right here. We'll get it, and uh, we'll get your name and everything like that, and it'll be on private between me and you, and we'll send you the information, or you can send it by email. When it's time for us to do a Zoom question and answer, or maybe one of our lessons will be on a Zoom, this is our personal meeting ID, and we'll, you need to contact on that, and we'll take it from there. Tomorrow is Thursday, Lord's willing. We'll come back again, at, uh, Lord's willing, at 8 o'clock to present our three courses on uh, the church history, biblical eldership, with us. May the Lord bless you, encourage your heart, and strengthen it.